Welcome to the Secrets of the Bible channel. We'll talk about Bathsheba in this video. Bathsheba is a memorable biblical woman because she was the central figure in the biggest scandal involving Israel's famed King David, son of Jesse. Bathsheba's name means daughter of the oath. Bathsheba's biblical stories include adultery and bloodshed, prophetic rebuke with catastrophic consequences, and the breaking and making of the throne. She was married to David one of the most beloved kings in the Bible, and she had four children, the first and most famous of whom was Solomon. The Bible never lavishes praise on its heroes. All of Scripture's men and women have clay feet, and when the Holy Spirit paints a portrait of their life, he's a very realistic artist. He does not deny or disregard the bad side. Except for the sin of Adam and Eve, no sin has garnered more attention than David's transgression with Bathsheba. The biblical narrative of this remarkable event implies that she was not a doctress, as most people portray her, but a prey who captured the attention of a great king at a time when he was already disconnected from his divine mission. When King David found Bathsheba in a precarious position, his inactivity, combined with his spiritual lethargy, was a guaranteed recipe for disaster, and he fell flat on his face. In fact, he was drawn into greater misdeeds that tarnished his reputation for the rest of his life. Instead of going to war against the Ammonites in the spring, David dispatched Joab against them, while remaining idle at home. Idleness is frequently accompanied by the greatest temptation. One evening he gazed out from his palace's roof and spotted a lovely woman, bathing. An investigation found that she was Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of David's strong warriors. David sent for her and had an affair with her. She cleansed herself of her ritual defilement and returned to her home. When she found out she was pregnant, she informed David. The king then devised a plan to conceal his guilt. First, he summoned Uriah from the fight, professing to be interested in Joab's and the army's progress. After Uriah had answered his questions, David told him to return home in the hopes of having relations with Bathsheba. When the infant was born, Uriah would believe it was his own child. Uriah, on the other hand, derailed David's intentions. Instead of returning home, he slept at the king's door. He did not believe he could enjoy the pleasure of home while his country was at war. In desperation, David got Uriah drunk, but the devoted soldier refused to return home. Uriah's loyalty and faithfulness contrast sharply with the king's betrayal. Then David sunk to his lowest level of infamy. He directed Uriah to deliver a letter to Joab, which conveyed Uriah's death sentence. The king ordered Joab to place Uriah in the thick of the fighting, where death was unavoidable. Uriah would not be living to condemn the resulting child. Joab planned the battle so that Uriah would be killed. He directed his forces to advance before ordering both flanks to withdraw. Uriah and his troops in the center were easy targets for the Ammonites on the wall as they advanced. Militarily, it was ludicrous, but it succeeded in destroying Uriah and many of David's devoted followers. When Joab returned the news to David, he knew the military defeat would enrage the monarch. Why did you approach so close to the city? David would ask. Didn't you recall how Abimelech, Gideon's son, Jerobosheth, was murdered for doing the same thing? As we see in the book of Judges. So Joab instructed the messenger to appease the king by saying, your servant Uriah, the Hittite, is also dead. This would make David forget about the day's military setbacks. As ordered, the messenger reported to David. Then he was directed to deliver a message to Joab, saying that military defeats are unavoidable, and that Uriah's death should not cause anguish, because the sword devours without discrimination in warfare. Thus, David attempted to cover up his great remorse. Following the traditional mourning period, David sent for Bathsheba to become his wife and the baby was born some time later. After Uriah died, David married Bathsheba. God's favorite man had progressed from lust to adultery, to deception, eventually taking a life and stealing another man's wife. But how did Bathsheba feel throughout all of this? Did she condone her husband's murder to conceal the pregnancy? Or did she feel guilty and distressed about everything that was going on? The Bible is silent on the subject, but one thing is certain. God was upset with David's obstinate heart and Bathsheba's quiet in the face of such evil. 
So God dispatched his prophet to approach the king and inform him that what he and Bathsheba thought was secret had been clearly seen by him. David truly repented and God pardoned all of their grave sins. Unfortunately, they lost that boy and Bathsheba must have been devastated by the loss of her previous husband and baby in such a short amount of time. Still, God consoled her by giving her another son, Solomon, and promising that he would be king after David's reign. 2 Samuel 12, 22-25 He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him. But he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. David was advanced in age and ill health by the time the events of one king's began. He couldn't stay warm no matter how nicely he was dressed. So the king's servants proposed that they find a young virgin who could warm and care for him. David's family turmoil, due to his past transgressions, followed him all the way to the grave. Adonijah, David's fourth son and Solomon's elder, saw the king's grave weakness and thought the time had come for him to make his move. He most likely felt he was the rightful successor because he was the eldest living son. Furthermore, prior to this occurrence, there is no record of David officially stating his choice of Solomon as his successor. First, he continued to elevate himself and declared, I will be king. Second, he attracted a large number of admirers due to his excellent looks and charm. Even David's military commander, Joab, his steadfast backer, Abiathar the priest, Adonijah's royal brothers, and all the men of Judah supported Adonijah. The prophet Nathan and Bathsheba quickly grasped the gravity of the situation. They devised a strategy to persuade David that unless he acted quickly and firmly, Adonijah would become king. Bathsheba approached David and reminded him of his oath to crown Solomon, their son. Because this promise is not stated elsewhere, it is possible that it was a private affair between them. She also informed him that Adonijah had declared himself king, was gaining support, and had declined Solomon's invitation to his banquet. That meant Solomon and his mother would be punished as criminals and enemies of the throne after David died and was buried. Nathan the prophet appeared before King David, echoing Bathsheba's story. Then he basically questioned the king. Did I miss anything? Did you support Adonijah without telling us? David was frail but not feeble-minded. He intended to uphold his previous promise. Adonijah had not engaged in armed revolt like Absalom. So, rather than attacking Adonijah and risking a civil war, David correctly reasoned that the majority of the people were still loyal to him. So David directed that his devoted servants anoint Solomon at Gihon, proclaim him king in front of all the people, and set him on David's throne. Fortunately, she had matured from the innocent person she had been for so many years into a wise queen. So she listened to the prophet Nathan and sought his advice on how to effectively manage this delicate problem in order to see God confirm the words he had stated previously. She went to her husband, the king, with humility and spoke wisely to him. Based on what his wife had said, David rose quickly and placed his crown on Solomon to anoint him king before any issues arose. Bathsheba's wisdom had brought in the peaceful reign of Solomon, but not long after that, she nearly fell into the Adonijah's scheme to become king. Fortunately, she had raised a son who was also a wise man, so he spotted the scheme as soon as the discussion came up. Adonijah had already demonstrated his desire to conspire for the throne. He should have faded into the background when Solomon spared his life, but he couldn't leave well enough alone. Adonijah approached Bathsheba and requested a calm conversation. He began by reminding her, cue the somber music, that he and every one of Israel expected him to be king, but that it had been taken away from him. He then made a request. Adonijah erroneously requested that Solomon's mother visit the king on his behalf and give him Abishag the Shunammite as his wife. Very well, Bathsheba replied, I will speak to the king for you. When Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, the king stood up to meet her. 
bowed down to her, and sat down on his throne. He had a throne brought for the king's mother, and she sat down at his right hand. I have one small request to make of you, she said. Do not refuse me. The king replied, make it my mother. I will not refuse you. So she said, let Abishag the Shunammite be given in marriage to your brother Adonijah. King Solomon answered his mother, why do you request Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? You might as well request the kingdom for him. After all, he is my older brother. Yes, for him and for Abiathar the priest, and Joab son of Zeruiah. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if Adonijah does not pay with his life for this request. And now, as surely as the Lord lives, he who has established me securely on the throne of my father David, and has founded a dynasty for me, as he promised. Adonijah shall be put to death today. So King Solomon gave orders to Benia son of Jehoiada, and he struck down Adonijah, and he died. 1 Kings 2, 1825 Abishag had been David's concubine, though he had not been intimate with her. To acquire a woman from a king's harem was to have grounds for claiming the crown. 2 Samuel 3, 6 7 During the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position in the house of Saul. Now Saul had had a concubine named Rizvan, daughter of Aya. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, why did you sleep with my father's concubine? Whether Bathsheba was unaware of Adonijah's request or understood it all too well, she related to the king. Solomon instantly saw Adonijah's appeal as a plot against the throne. He responded, you might as well beg the throne for him, because he is my elder brother. Because Adonijah was the next king in line, marrying Abishag would have given him two claims to the throne in the eyes of Israel's people. So in Solomon's opinion, his brother's request was an act of treason. Adonijah paid with his life for this plotting. However, there was more going on here than the simple removal of Solomon's adversary. God was still punishing David and his family for their previous sins of adultery and murder. Years previously, David had passed judgment on himself when he mistook himself for the villain in Nathan's fable about a rich man eating a poor fellow's beloved sheep. He'd stated, as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. Because he has done this thing and shown no pity, he must pay four lambs for that lamb. Don't forget that God took David at his word. Until now, David had atoned for his crimes by sacrificing three lambs, his sons Amnon Absalom and the unnamed child. Adonijah was the fourth casualty. The lesson is clear, even redeemed sin has ramifications. Bathsheba's story is one of humiliation turning to glory and tears being wiped away as she reigned as a wise queen in Israel. Because of his wisdom, her son would go on to become as famous as his father. Yet, Bathsheba plays a more involved role in ensuring that her second son becomes an inheritor of the throne. She intimates his royal destiny by naming him Solomon, which suggests well-being or wholeness. We observe an early relationship between Bathsheba and Nathan, the prophet, who names the child Jedidiah, which means friend of God or beloved of God. Indeed, this child will inherit the throne and construct the temple in Jerusalem. Bathsheba takes an active part in ensuring that her son is proclaimed successor to the kingdom in the first chapters of the Book of Kings. In yet another invocation of an oath, Bathsheba plays a pivotal role, either wittingly or unwittingly, in eliminating the rival brother, Adonijah, son of Haggith. Again, she plays the messenger to her son, the king, in requesting Abishag as wife on behalf of Adonijah. Seeing the request as a bid for the throne, Solomon utters an oath to have his brother executed. Her name, Bathsheba, which might be either daughter of abundance or daughter of seven, takes on a whole new meaning as woman of oath. As a result of her position in the succession table, given her polar roles, the earlier passive and opaque, the latter effective and perhaps conniving, we can read her account as either two extremely different qualities or as a record of psychological change. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for your exceedingly great grace that brings forgiveness and restoration even to the most troubled life in the name of Jesus. I ask for your direction and wisdom to keep me from making wrong decisions while leading me to the right path. Amen.